Well, Daniel, appreciate you taking the time today. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to Israel, but I want to start with the world's posture towards Israel, particularly America's posture. What do you make of the changes that we have seen of late in how Israel is being addressed in this ongoing war against Hamas? Well, certainly. Thank you, Billy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, we kind of always thought there would be a turn against Israel from the international community and also including, including the United States. But I want to put a couple of things in perspective. So we are on day 171 of this war. It's been 171 days since October 7th. That is the longest war for Israel since its War of Independence in 1948, 1949. Uh, and frankly, the Biden administration has not yet said stop fighting. In 2014, Ob uh, the Obama administration essentially told their Israel to stop fighting after 51 days during Operation Protective Edge. 2006, it was uh, 34 days in the Second Lebanon War. Sort of point where the administration hasn't definitively said stop fighting. Of course, frankly, Israel would not listen to that. Uh, and that would become a breach of the relationship. But we are getting the last number of weeks and few months an increasingly hostile uh, and questionable rhetoric from the administration, from the president himself, the vice president, uh, Secretary Blinken, and other senior members of the, of the staff. So it's disconcerting to say the least. But the support for Israel from the Congress has been very strong, from the American people, per poll results are obviously very strong as well. And the administration has been getting munitions and other supplies to Israel. But of course, rhetoric is also very important. You know, when you start putting pressure on Israel to take certain steps and how it conducts this operation, you have to consider the audience. And the audience is not just Israel. A lot of it from this administration is obviously their constituents with who they believe their voters are in terms of people, I guess, not wanting to support Israel somehow. But also Hamas is watching. Uh, other bad actors in the world are watching. And so Hamas has been rejecting ceasefire deals left and right, for example. They're probably thinking, well, we have the Biden administration on our side putting pressure on Israel, not putting pressure on us, putting pressure on Israel and not putting pressure on uh, uh, Sisi in Egypt to open the Rafah crossing, for example, to let refugees out or other aid in. So it's increasingly uh, disturbing and disconcerting. It's not really much of a surprise, frankly. And even just today, the UN Security Council passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire. Uh, I'll say pause. They also called for uh, the release of hostages not exactly in the same breath, and the U.S. abstained. So it was this resolution passed, and it's actually, um, you know, history doesn't uh, repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And in 2000, uh, 2016, and, and its way out of, uh, out of office, the Obama administration also abstained from resolution that essentially ignored the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, to, the, to Jerusalem in particular. So you have something similar going on right now, the same cast of characters and more senior position. But overall, the rhetoric against Israel that's rising is very disconcerting. You know, you look at, and there's so many factors at play here politically, right? You look at what you just mentioned, the Obama administration outgoing, making that decision. You then have the Trump administration where you have these very historic moments, the Abraham Accords. You then have, you obviously have the Capitol being moved to Jerusalem, something that people had said again and again they were going to do. By people, I mean presidents. It was never done. Then that happens. Then you move back to, you know, sort of the Obama slash Biden mentality and you have strong support at the beginning. Then you have what you have going on right now, which appear to be cracks in that. I mean, the big question, obviously, and this is what you're hearing from the administration, from others, this question of, OK, well, what does victory look like you know, against Hamas? What, what does that manifest itself as? Is that possible? I want to throw those questions to you because yeah. you've been looking at this very closely. What does that victory actually look like? So the, the Israeli government has two sort of three explicit war aims. Uh, one is to return the house, restore or rescue the hostages, return them to Israel. Uh, and there are currently about 132 still being held captive in Gaza. Uh, I think you could kind of back in the envelope, think that maybe about 80 or 90 are still alive, God willing more, but we're not really sure. So return them to Israel. The second objective is to dismantle the Hamas political and military infrastructure in Gaza, not just so it returns, but in a degraded form, but is unable to perpetrate an October 7th invasion and massacre again. And the third kind of more general, and this also brings us to the border in the north, is to restore security to Israeli uh, civilians, to Israel, the border communities in general. And the way to understand this war, it's not just another round or operation between Israel and Hamas. This is a war for Israel's survival. And 
I think one thing kind of the Biden administration is not necessarily appreciate that, and many critics of Israel don't really appreciate that, and that Israel, Israelis in many ways are fighting a second war of independence. Because if Hamas is able to perpetrate October 7th, and Israel's unable to then destroy Hamas, which again means essentially not allowing it to restore its political military capabilities in the Gaza Strip, um, then essentially what that means is anybody can actually attack the Jewish state because they're the Jewish state and get away with it. And the purpose of Israel as a state is to be a refuge and security for the Jewish people. And so that's what Israel's fighting for. And so victory looks like the returning of the hostages, God willing, um, you know, as soon as we can. But more broadly than that is removing any threat on Israel's borders. And again, there are over 100,000 Israelis who have been uh, internally displaced from the southern communities from the Gaza border, also in the north. Uh, the government mandated over 60,000, another 20 or so thousand left from the northern border because on October 8th, Hezbollah started firing rockets. And what we're seeing right now on the northern border is effectively the third Lebanese war, the third war between Israel and, and, and Hezbollah. Um, and so Israel cannot live, Israelis cannot live in a situation in a, in, a, in a country where they are unable to live peacefully in their homes on their borders. So ultimately, this is what Israel's war is about. Now, that, that's really helpful because I think a lot of people are looking at this. And of course, people in America are looking at things through an American lens, right? You know, we don't really have, obviously, we have the issues with the southern border right now. You have a northern border where there aren't as many issues, obviously, uh, with Canada. It's a totally different paradigm. But there's also this other, and, and you'll hear this argument of, well, you know, we can't be involved in all of the world's affairs. I mean, you're hearing a lot of people say this. We shouldn't be helping Ukraine. We shouldn't be funding Israel. Let's talk about Israel, though. We're not going to talk about Ukraine right now. When it comes to Israel, it's very easy to think, oh, this doesn't affect us. We don't have to worry about this. Why do you believe this is an issue, what is happening to Israel, that America should care about and that actually might have bigger ramifications than obviously just impacting the Israeli people? Certainly. And there's really three ways to look at this, I'd say. One is we are, I believe, in a new Cold War, not just with you know the former Soviet Union or, or Russia in particular. But there's a growing axis out there between Russia, Iran, and China, an axis of resistance. Actually, Iran calls its proxy network in the Middle East the axis of resistance. But these three countries are working in concert uh, to push back against the Western U.S.-led liberal order. You see this with Russia and Ukraine, with Iran basically tapping Hamas and obviously Hezbollah against Israel and potentially China against Taiwan. Now, all three countries, Russia, Iran, and China, do not share the same ideology, obviously. But they have a common goal, which is, again, the pushing back against the West, against the United States. So this is one battlefront in that war. And that, and we should be supporting our allies in that front, in this case, Israel, and I also argue in the European theater, Ukraine. But that's one element. And this also denotes a broader civilizational struggle as well. Uh, you know, one, I, I served in the Israeli Defense Forces. I'm American. I served there for a number of reasons, one of which is because the same enemies Israel faces always come here to the US, certainly to the West more broadly. Europe is obviously geographically closer to, to the Middle East, but they come here as well. So this is a, again, another salient that we in the West and America should be supporting our allies because the threats Israel faces don't just stay in the Middle East, don't just stay there. And then the biggest fear I'd say is, you know, first they came, they're coming for the Saturday people and then they'll come for the Sunday people meaning they're coming for the Jews today, but particularly for your audience, they're going to come for the Christians tomorrow. Um, this well, let's not forget 9-11. I mean, let's well, not forget 9-11 and all of the other events that I, I think people have a very short memory span yeah. of what, right? I mean, of what has happened historically, not even that long ago to America itself. Right. And it's a very good point. You know, 9-11, why did it happen? I mean, a, a number of reasons, but really because the U.S. has been involved supporting Israel in the Middle East, and the same fanatics, Osama bin Laden and others, did not like that, wanted to push back against our presence there in the region. And it wasn't just Israel they're fighting against, it's the United States. And Iran themselves, or the Iranians themselves, call the U.S. the great Satan and Israel the little Satan. We're, 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 we are tied to the hip whether you want to be or not. Uh, so for these reasons, and then we could get into a whole other, a whole other conversation about why Israel is an indispensable and strategic ally for the United States, particularly in the Middle East. But beyond that, it is our, our own interest as Americans and as uh, citizens of the Western world to be supporting Israel. I'd argue as well to be supporting Ukraine, but to be supporting Israel in this fight. 
I want to go back to you obviously served in the IDF and watching all of this in light of that experience. What has it been like going back to October 7th and everything that has followed with this war? Just thinking back and sort of pondering on your experience and what you know is going on on the ground. Maybe take us into what you know troops are dealing with. I mean, this is we often don't get that perspective of somebody who has been there. So I'd love to just hear your reflections on that. Certainly. So I'll take that in two parts because looking at two different areas, the south and the north. Uh, in Gaza, obviously, there's a hot war right now. It's been for 170 days. Um, and Israelis, let me actually back up a second. On October 6th, the most divisive issue, important issue in Israeli society at the time was this proposed judicial reform, which was threatening to rip apart the fabric of Israeli society. It's a little overwrought, but the idea that Israelis are coming out in droves and tens of thousands every weekend night to protest, support, or actually in favor to, to support these uh, these reforms. That all changed on October 7th. So Israelis are unified as never before in their purpose. And right now on the, in, in Gaza, you know, it's a very difficult battlefield. It's a very difficult front. It's unheard of, unlike any battlefield in essentially not even modern military history, but military history writ large. Uh, to give a sense, Israelis are fighting um, the perfect battlefield that Hamas has spent 17 years developing. So in 2005, Ham uh, Israel unilaterally pulled out about 9,000 civilians and some military bases from the Gaza Strip, and Hamas took over, and then 2006 won elections, has been controlling the Gaza Strip ever since, the last 17 years. And they spent billions of dollars in the international community, including American taxpayer dollars, have been funneling there to build this network of, um, of, of tunnels to underneath the Gaza Strip, uh, and totaling about 350 or so miles, which is even longer than the New York subway system. It's about twice, or the Paris Metro and the London Underground combined. Um, so they've been wow. building a perfect battlefield we're having command and control centers in hospitals. We're seeing just a few days ago, as we record this uh, late March, about uh, Al Shifa Hospital in the northern part of the Gaza Strip that the IDF uh, conquered, essentially cleaned of um, uh, Hamas terrorists and discovered tunnels leading up to it. But then Hamas reconstituted itself in this in this hospital that the IDF had another pitched battle a few days ago and captured hundreds of Hamas fighters, killed a few dozen as well. But they've been spending 17 years building this battlefield. It's very difficult. It's an on-ground, it's a below-ground battlefront. Uh, and right, and also they're fighting among the civilian population, about 2 million civilians in Gaza. So it's an extremely difficult battlefield. Uh, but Israelis are obviously unified in their purpose. They know what they're fighting for. On the northern front, uh, I spent a lot of my time on the Lebanese border. In 2010 to 12, when I served, it was a very quiet border. It was the, with a relatively quiet enemy. It was a beautiful, serene area. You've looked at it as one of the best postings you could have throughout Israel different story right now. A lot of guys I served with who are doing reserve duty, they're back on the northern border with orders probably to return for an actual war, more kinetic engagement later this spring or summer. Uh, but right now, the threat from the north is much more significant than the threat from Hamas ever was. Because Hezbollah in the north possesses between 150 and 200,000 rockets and missiles, many of which can strike throughout Israel. And about 90% of Israel's population and industrial capacity is in the center of the country. And most of Hamas, uh, excuse me, Hezbollah's rockets and arsenal can, can strike there. So right now, the soldiers are, again, morale is very high. I'm, I'm getting from guys that I, I know with who are serving. Morale is very high. And there's also a sense that, again, kind of getting back to your our first part of the conversation about the turn against Israel in popular public opinion uh, in the national community, it, it's always just kind of saying we don't really care because we're fighting a war of a second war of independence. Uh, so the motivation is high and the sense of purpose and clarity of mission is, is certainly there. How danger, or what is the risk at this point of that northern border exploding into something very, I mean, you mentioned those those missiles, those rockets, the ability mm -hmm. to reach, I mean, that, that appears to be, and you are the expert here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but far more dangerous potentially to Israel than anything else that's going on right now. It certainly is. And then let's put things in, in perspective to a few different degrees. Uh, October 7th was the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust, a horrific thing for Israel and really for the Jewish community worldwide. Uh, however, it did not threaten Israel existentially in the same way from a military perspective that a war from the north would. It threatened Israel because it made Israelis clear, realize that, wait, our position in, this, in the region is in jeopardy and we can't have in 2023 
any organization commit a pogrom against the Jewish people. There has been a pogrom against the Jewish people since we call it the Holocaust or since 1941, the Farhud in, in Iraq. Um, and that's what that was. So the purpose, again, the Israeli government is to prevent that. So you have to prevent that. But from a purely strategic and military perspective, the threat from the north is far more significant. It presents perhaps an existential threat to Israel. You already have, I mentioned, nearly about 80 or so thousand Israeli uh, citizens, civilians who've been evacuated from the northern communities. How can you live in a country where you can't go to your home now for 170 plus days? Um, and there's been a lot of activity on the northern front. By activity, I mean rockets, RPG fire, small arms fire, drones coming in from Hezbollah, from, in, from southern and even a little bit further north in Lebanon into northern Israel. Israel's responding with airstrikes, with artillery strikes, with also, also small, small arms fire as well. So there's a lot of activity. I mentioned earlier, we are seeing a war between Israel and Hezbollah, but particularly from a you know, the, the political leadership in Israel does not want to call it a war because that would denote a much broader full scale engagement. And they're focusing on the war in the South right now, understandably. But it does not mean war is not coming. And what could trip it are a few different things. One is simply escalate, uh, you know, miscalculation or escalation. Hezbollah has been trying to strike some IDF facilities on the northern part by the Lebanese Syrian border by Mount Hermon as, um, and strike there. If there are more strikes on perhaps hospitals in northern Israel, something that would escalate up the escalation ladder, Israel has to respond. Getting different reports that Iran does not want Hezbollah to escalate right now because what ultimately what is the purpose of Hezbollah? Hezbollah exists in Lebanon ultimately as an Iranian second strike capability against Israel in the event that Israel ever strikes Iran directly over its nuclear program or other reasons. Because Iran could always say, you know, Israel, don't strike us because we'll unleash, again, tens of thousands of rockets against you if you strike us over our nuclear program or other proxy organizations. So Israel, uh, Iran does not want to lose that pawn they have over you know, the Damocles sword holding over Israel's head. From Israel's perspective, since 2006, the last war, Hezbollah has reconstituted itself and developed its capabilities probably tenfold, I'm not sure exact number, but significantly. And again, they're an ever-present threat that perhaps right now the political and military situation in Israel and in the world is such that Israel should be able to go and remove that threat to the extent possible. And also, the last thing I'll say before moving on is like, make no mistake that if there's a war with Hezbollah, the capital W war, it will be devastating, particularly on the Lebanese side of the border. And one thing Israel needs to do is to try to find and take out as many rocket launching sites as possible. But like Hamas and Gaza, Hezbollah also perfected the art of embedding itself among the civilian population, digging tunnels potentially underneath the, uh, the border into Israel. Granted, the terrain is very different. It's very hilly, very mountainous, um, and had this tunnel system within uh, Lebanon as well. But it would be a very costly war really on both sides. Yeah, and, and I so appreciate you taking us through that because I, I think people, again, they, they don't have the, the know-how and the background that you do. They can't necessarily see beyond what could happen. And we have to think about what are the what ifs, right? If one mistake is made, as you were saying, one escalation, what will follow as a result of that potentially? And it could be catastrophic. Um, and I think people also don't have an understanding of what it really means to have to fight for your survival. Um, that is something the Jewish people have had to do again and again throughout history, um, of course, throughout recent history in the last 100 years in particular, um, but also throughout history in general. And so we're looking at this and we're seeing, obviously, October 7th, this horrific event. There are a lot of questions around this as we sort of round out you know, towards the second half of our conversation here. But one of the big questions, of course, how did this happen? Intelligence failures. There's a lot there that we won't fully get into. But the question I would ask you in light of the fact that we're even here, here having this conversation, how did October 7th, in your view, transform potentially forever Israeli security? Oh, boy. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the growing theme that this is Israel's second war of independence is perhaps the most apt because what did the war of independence do for the Jewish people? First off, it uh, made Zionism a realization, and Zionism is simply the belief of Jewish sovereignty in their ancient homeland, the land of Israel. So it gave them a state from which they could defend themselves. In the last 15 plus years, you could say that Israel perhaps has grown complacent in many ways. If you look at the last 15 years since the, since the 2006 Lebanon war, from 2006 to October 6 was actually one of the calmest, quietest periods in Israeli history. Now, there were 
no fewer than four operations against Hamas in Gaza from 2008 to 2021. There were other things going on in Judea and Samaria and the West Bank. But taken as a whole, it was very quiet. And moreover, again, if you're in the north, it was a very peaceful area to be in. And the wars against Hamas and Gaza were down in the south. And so effectively, you started getting different constituencies around the country that had different objectives. And the southern communities were kind of saying, you know, Jerusalem, the government, you needed to do a better job protecting us against the Hamas threat. And northern communities were essentially ignored from that just simply by distance. But this then obviously, although the communities among the Gaza envelope just outside the Gaza Strip were the ones who were directly attacked on October 7th, obviously all of Israel is invested in this fight. So the, trans the security now is going to be focused on making sure that Israel does not become complacent from a military, political, and security perspective again. And ensuring that the the founding principles or doctrines of the IDF instilled by David Ben-Gurion and others of this founding father generation, uh, meaning that when there is a threat, the IDF needs to act preemptively, needs to act decisively and quickly, that that I think will come back to the fore. Uh, because the, the, broad, the biggest picture here is why it's a second war of independence. It's the question right now that Israel faces is not only if Hamas is unable to be defeated, what does that mean for Israel? More broadly than that, there was a normalization effort with Saudi Arabia just until October 7th. Now, I'll say that actually normalization efforts are still ongoing. They have not been shelled. I've heard from numerous sources. They're still ongoing, not on the front burner right now, obviously, but they're not, they're not shelled. But if Israel's unable to win this war, meaning defeat Hamas, then Saudi Arabia might be thinking, maybe we backed the wrong horse. Maybe Israel is not the future of the region because the Abraham Accords are predicated that Israel is a solution to these, to these Arab uh, countries' problems. And they also present a security solution to the Iranian threat as well. But if they can't defeat Hamas, then how can they help us against the Iranians or other issues that we have from a, a security perspective, a strategic perspective, and a political one? So that's really the kind of question here. And I'd say for the American audience too is, if the Biden administration and the American people in general do not allow Israel to win this war, then in Saudi Arabia, you know, what good is the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia then as well and these Arab countries in general? Because are we back in the wrong course? Did we allow a terrorist organization to win as well? So getting back to Israel, this is really the, the lens through which they're viewing everything. And if we want to understand why and how they're prosecuting the war that they are, we need to really keep that in mind that this is a war for the second independence. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying this is the case or this is how it happened, but you can also understand how a guard would be let down when you have those positive advances, when you have Saudi Arabia and others saying, hey, we want to normalize or we want to work towards that. When you have these agreements coming into place, how that would give you a comfortable ability that might be actually deceitful in some ways, right, or not fully accurate to what is going on. So again, I'm not saying that's what happened, but it, but it, you do wonder the impact of those dynamics on uh, maybe the positions that Israel was taking on their own defense. Uh, but but last question for you on, I mean, there's so many questions. I could talk to you for hours on this, but the anti-Semitism that we're seeing, it was yeah. very apparent. It always has been, but very apparent in the early days, right after October 7th, watching people on university campuses all over the West, not just in the Middle East, saying things that were very strange, holding up troubling signs. We've seen this rhetoric and we've seen attacks and assaults, again, for years that have been increasing. But what do you make of this explosion of anti-Semitism across the globe right now in light of what is happening in Israel against Hamas? The Jewish community is extremely disturbed by it um, on a few different levels. We thought, A lot of people we thought were our friends, interfaith uh, friends or allies, have either not shown up or shown up uh, in small numbers, not you know, not enforced for us, and so it makes us concerned where are our allies in, in, in the in, in the country, in the world, etc. Uh, but it's also it's also very telling that October seventh revealed people and policies and leaders and forces for who and what they are, and that the masks are off, that the veneer that anti-Zionism is not a form of anti-Semitism is obviously false on its face. Uh, that people could be somehow anti-Israel but not anti-Semitic is also a lie as well. Uh, so it, it's it's really disconcerting, and this kind of gets back to our conversation earlier about what um, you know what this means for us here in America is that anti-Semitism is a societal ill, and that any country that falls prey to it or any society that falls prey to it ultimately decays. 
Uh, and this is a big issue, frankly, in the Arab world in general. And one of the reasons the Abraham Accord countries are kind of miraculous in some ways is that they're, they are not an anti-Semitic society by and large. They actually want to embrace Israel. They're fairly philo-Semitic, as I understand it, from a people-to-people -people perspective. But a lot of the issues right now in the Arab world stems from anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism has nothing to do with the Jews, frankly. It has a lot to do with the anti-Semites. Because what they do is they take their own personal ills or misgivings um, on a personal level or ones they view from society, and they impose it on the Jews because they try to think the Jews are the other and they're going to be the scapegoat for whatever my ills are from a societal perspective or an individual perspective. So again, the anti-Semitism is not about the Jews, it's about the anti-Semite. And ultimately, we should be very concerned right now in the United States that our college campuses, our elite college campuses are awash with anti-Semites. And I'd say more importantly, those who are unable or sorry, unwilling, but able to stand up to them, speaking particularly of our, you know, the presidents of some of these Ivy League universities. Um, so we must be very vigilant about this. And I'd ask as, as, as a Jewish person to everyone out there who can support your Jewish friends, colleagues, neighbors, whomever, please do so. And this is an issue that's not just facing the Jewish community, but facing all of America, because like I said earlier, they come for us first, the Saturday people, but come for the Sunday people next. Well, Daniel, I so appreciate you breaking this down. We want to have you back again as time goes on. There are going to be developments, things we need to break down and talk about. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Billy. It's been a pleasure.